Oh yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Jared here. I decided to take the reins a little bit because I I will encourage Kevin to do a series on uh, game master tips and, and gameplay tips, not just on you know recapping our games and talking about reviews, but also like how can we make individual games, no matter what they are, better. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you about several different methods uh, you had for spicing up the game a little bit and, and making it interesting, making it flow better. Uh, I mean, we've played multiple games together now, and I've seen some of the tips and tricks that you use. And mm -hmm. you've let me some reading, uh, right. like Play Dirty Parts <coughs> 1 and 2 by John, John Wick. Wick's seminal work. Yeah. Um, and that was a, a great insight into game mastering. And so I wanted to talk to you uh, in a, a short series, I guess, about tips. And the first one I wanted to ask about was disengaged players. Because we were at the table, and we had a player at the table who spent the entire time playing some app game instead of yes. playing our game. 21st century curse of the game table is the cell phone. Um, it, it is very hard to keep players engaged all the time when there's this digital piece of engagement dancing right under their nose. And I know some groups have a no phone policy, you have to go put it in a closet or turn it off. But unfortunately, a lot of us have families and, and we've got to be able to take emergency calls, so that's not really an option for us. But I was thinking a lot about how do you get around the problem of, oh, well, it's not my turn, so I'll just play a turn on this game, and then the next thing you know, you've lost half the table. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what it comes down to is what one of my education professors said in, to me in the 90s. Idle hands really are the devil's workshop. So every time you give players downtime, you're inviting them to reach for their phone, to see what's going on, to look at the world, and then you've lost them, you know, and it's gonna be kicking and screaming. So the key is, how do you keep your players engaged? Because you want them to be engaged, you want them to want to pay attention all the time. Okay, I mean, I'll admit, I'm a, I'm a <coughs> digital gamer, so mm -hmm. I've played regular video games, and even when we're sitting at the table, I've got a laptop with all of my game material on it. So the rule book's on my copy of the rule book's yep. on it, my yep. character sheet is on it. Uh, and so I'll occasionally start diving into character background, or I'll get curious about something while we're at the table, and all my focus will shift a little bit. And I try and be better, but I just wanted, you know, how do we keep all the gamers to at least make that, at least half a brain, uh, paying attention to somebody else's time in the spotlight? Right. Uh, all of us have fallen into that. I've fallen into that. You know, I say it's really important to stay engaged, and here I am running the game, and I've caught myself going, oh, I need to look something up because the players just asked me an interesting question. Oh, look, I've got an email. And then, you know, the next thing I go, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a ferret. I'm off chasing something shiny. It's terrible. We all fall victim to it. And so that's why I was really glad that you asked me, how do you do this? Because then it made me think much more seriously. At, okay, how do I do this? What really does work? and try and be a little bit more scientific, codify it a little bit, and then start actively taking note of what works and doesn't work with different players as ways to keep them engaged. So today I thought we'd talk about giving players things to do so that they never had time to drift away. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk about other ideas in other videos. Okay, Okay. so, so what do you give players to do when they're not the one taking the turn? Okay, so the first one, this comes back to my days when I was a GURPS player and I ran GURPS a lot. GURPS has a lot of rules. There are rules for everything in GURPS. It's a very heavily codified system, or at least it was back when I played it in the 90s. I admit I haven't played it in the 2000s. And so we had an assigned job called rules lawyer. Now I know the term rules lawyer has taken on some really negative connotations around game tables, but in our group, at our table, rules lawyer was an honored position. You were considered to be a person who knew a lot of rules and who knew how to go find them when they were needed. So one person was designated, you're the rules lawyer. We have a question, you look it up. The GM keeps the game going. So for instance, if somebody wants to do some trick shot in a combat scene, if you stop to look up that rule, the whole game just grinds to a halt. So instead, the GM would say, okay, I need the rules lawyer to look up that for me. In the meantime, the GM could jump onto the next player in initiative order and keep the flow going while the rules lawyer was looking it up. And then the rules lawyer would say, okay, I got a GM. And the GM would go, okay, what's the rule? And then, so if there was any clarity issue. Now, 
uh, a lot of the games I play now are more heavily narrative, so it's not as important to have a rule lawyer. But I have caught a few times, particularly in Fantasy Age, not as much in Savage Worlds, but particularly in Fantasy Age. Well, there's a more complex system on my end as a player. <clears throat> yes, exactly. And so we've had several instances where the whole table stopped mm -hmm. so we could figure out what exactly a rule was. And I know GM 101 is just keep the game going, make a quick ruling, keep mm -hmm. the game going. But we're all like teachers and stuff. We actually want to know what the right answer is. So we all stop and we look it up. And, and I'm starting to think that now it might be time, since we've been playing this for a while, to designate somebody as rules lawyer. And if a rule question does come up, it's their job. It doesn't have to be the same person each game, but it's certainly a way for a player who, again, like many of us teachers, likes to be right. Mm -hmm. Give them the authority to go be the person who's right, and that way you can keep things moving. Well, uh, this also makes me think, um in games where we don't have as many rules to keep track of, or, we, or the GM just wants to keep the gameplay going, we play a lot of uh, multi-episode serial games. And so the story keeps going, and so perhaps a historian at the table, right? Oh, what alien race did we encounter? What planets did we colonize? What events happened three sessions ago? Someone's been keeping track in their notes, mm -hmm. and they can go find that for us so we can keep continuity, and so we don't get confused about who is who or who did what. So in TV parlance, the person who keeps the show Bible. Yes. Who, who has all those records. Yeah, Because I know we share a lot of that through Google Drive, but yeah. it would be neat to have one person who's in charge of knowing that stuff mm -hmm. or knowing where to put their fingers on it. So that might be a new slot. So we have rules lawyer and we have continuity lawyer. Okay, so besides giving them roles to play, how else would you feel? <clears throat> uh, or, no, sorry. How else would you <clears throat> keep the players uh, going at the same pace? So combat's a great opportunity for player downtime. If it's not your turn, it's very easy to think, well, nobody needs me, I can check out for a minute, I can reply to this text real quick. So uh, a thing I got from another friend, and again, this is way back when I was playing in college, he ran action games a lot. And in order to keep the sensation of action high, you know, spy games and espionage and infiltration, he gave you a count. If you didn't know what you were doing, you could ask him any questions you wanted during the count. Mm -hmm. But when he got to zero, your turn was over and you hadn't acted. Mm -hmm. And he went on to the next player. And uh, I've been pushing that in the fantasy game pretty heavily mm -hmm. because it's meant to be an action game. It's not meant to be a cerebral game. It's meant to be high adventure. And so at a certain point, I, say, I start counting down. You know, mm -hmm. if a player can't make a decision quickly. And as we get more and more into the game and people get more and more comfortable with the game, then more and more I'm using it mm -hmm. because now it's not a matter of you don't know how, it's a matter of, okay, you need to be ready. Mm -hmm. So when your turn comes around, know what you want to do. Know what other people are doing. Would you use a visual? <clears throat> like, like grab a 30-second hourglass from a, some other board game you have? I do, but I use my fingers. Okay. I count down right in front of them. I go, five, one, mm -hmm. two. Or I count down, five, four, mm -hmm. three. And so it's very clear, you know. Make up your mind. You have five seconds. Or, you're, or you've lost your action. Okay. You know? uh, every now and then we do a quick stop because in Fantasy Age you have to stop and look at the chart whenever you roll doubles and you've got stunt points. So every now and then it'll be, okay, you get a little extra time to decide what stunts you're doing. But even then, well, at, the, at make our table at least, we, we make suggestions to each other. We're playing the game collaboratively. Mm -hmm. So perhaps I think you'd be better off doing these two stunts instead of those two stunts. Sure. Uh, and so we can take a moment to do what's best for the action or for the party as a whole. And I don't mind that at all because it keeps everybody engaged. Mm -hmm. when, when people are pitching into what's going on, when people are contributing, whether it's a tactical suggestion or a rule suggestion or a, oh, wouldn't it be neat if, you know, kind of flavor text thing, like, oh, you've been fighting this guy, could you have walked him up to the back of a wall? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm for that. That's player engagement. That's, I'm great with that. I'm, I'm not at all one of those GMs who thinks that if I didn't put it there, then it doesn't exist. I absolutely want the players actively contributing to Well, that's the story. going to be a topic of another video. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is how much of it is the game master's <clears throat> creation, how much of it is the player creation or collaborative creation. Right. Okay, so so we've covered combat time, keeping it fast, <clears throat> giving people different tasks to do. Mm -hmm. um, but what keeps them interested in each other's actions versus just ignoring each other? So we have a trick called Blah, mm -hmm. and there are so many scenes in a role-playing game or in a movie where two characters have to talk so that one of them can pass information to the other one. 
and the other player ideally knows all this information. They're just waiting for the other character to tell them. Mm. And so a friend of mine introduced Blah. And Blah is, you just saw me role play this scene over here and you heard me talk to the spy. Now I'm coming back and telling you everything he told me. Mm. Hey, hey, Jared, Blah. You uh -huh. know. And, and you can even do it with inflection. You can go, Blah? <laughs> or you can go, Blah! Right. And, and so it puts emphasis onto, I'm transmitting this information and here's an emotional context. Now, the catch to that is, you have to have watched us role play that scene. If you didn't, now I gotta go back and I gotta walk you through it in real time, mm -hmm. which takes up table time. And well, uh, us gamers also, of a mature age, we only have so much time at the table anyway. Yes. Well, this also makes it so that I'm not just angering the GM when I'm off task, I'm not angering anybody else I could be getting more information from. And so I've slowed down more people at the table mm. who are all going to put their anger on me for being the person slowing everybody down. Right. So it's not just that, you know, oh, one person's upset, everybody else is, everybody else is fine with it. Now everybody's kind of in, has to be worried about it. What do I need to know to keep my player knowledge up to date so I can keep track of what my character knowledge is? Right. Well, you know, it's that joke also that you have to keep in mind that no drop of water thinks they're responsible for the flood. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, a little time waste here, a little time waste there, a little time waste somewhere else, and the next thing you know, you've lost an hour of your session, and you only had a three to four hour session. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that comes up a lot in board game design, is, is we sometimes look at, okay, how could I trim 15 seconds off a player's turn? Mm -hmm. And 15 seconds doesn't sound like that much time until you multiply by the number of player turns, mm -hmm. and then you find that you just shorten the game by half an hour. Uh, I had a train game I was working on, and this might be a digression and I might have to cut all of this out. But I had a train game I was working on and I used to have players start the turn by rolling dice and we had just one set of dice that we passed around. Mm -hmm. And I changed it so that each player had their own set of dice and you rolled them at the end of your turn so you could start planning. Well, that game went immediately from a three to four hour game to a two to three hour game. Okay. We had cut an hour of play time out just by having people pre-plan. Or I heard recently watching Puffin Forest, shout out, <laughs> And uh, he plays a D&D &D Adventurer's League. Mm -hmm. And when they play Adventurer's League, everybody rolls their to hit and their damage on the same die roll. So they don't wait for the GM to say you hit before they roll damage. They just roll both. And if the GM says you hit, then they look at the damage die. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't hit, then they just ignore the damage die. And that doesn't sound like a big difference. But you iterate that over every round of combat, mm -hmm. and suddenly you've saved a whole lot of time, and you've really sped the game up. So any of these little things that get people doing multiple steps or being ready to act right before their turn comes up speeds up play. Well, just having everybody be prepared just in having enough dice, right? Right. Rather than having to change, change hands and keep passing it around. Sure. It's easy enough at this point, everybody should have their own set, be ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then you've also had moments in the game where we all roll perception. You'll come back to us later for what that means, but do it now just so it's, it's queued up. Exactly. And we don't have to waste any more time later. And we all just got, wait, wait, why did we roll Why did that? we roll person? Let's yeah. focus on what's happening to the next person because that might influence what's happening to us. Well, no GM has ever asked for a perception roll and the players thought it was a good thing. Yes. You know, th this is like when your significant other says we need to talk. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no way <laughs> there's no that's, that's a conversation you want to have. But so the player's like, what? what? Why did he ask us to roll person? He's sneaky, what's he up to? Yes, anything that will do that. Okay, and you once referenced to me about a, a comic book style of play, what does that mean? Oh, uh, so that, that came again from the same guy who invented Blah. Mm -hmm. That was his code for um, knowing what was happening when other people had a scene that you weren't in. He called it read each other's comic book. Mm -hmm. He used to say, okay, so imagine like we're in the Avengers or the Justice League, where we've each got our own comic books. Mm -hmm. But very often in the Avengers or the Justice League, those being the two big comics of that type, the characters would talk about things that were happening off in their own comic mm -hmm. book. And if you hadn't read their own comic book, you didn't know what that conversation was about. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the 70s and 80s, it would even say, oh, go read Captain America number 300 or whatever, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, and then you'd have to go buy that issue or read that issue. And so Quentin, my friend, used to say, okay, everybody, if it's not your turn, read each other's comic book. Know what's going on in their character's life so that then when they come back to the party, you know what they're bringing with them, good or ill. Okay. And, and then that led to blah because, oh, we'd all read each other's comic book. Mm -hmm. We didn't need to know 
all of that stuff waste verbatim. Time on more right, right. We could just have little short pieces of conversation that signal, oh, these characters know what's going on. You know. Okay. Um, so two other things about using time. Do you keep the party together or do you split the party up? Mm -hmm. And I say you can do both, but, but splitting the party up is harder. Yeah. So if you keep the party together, it's a whole lot easier to keep everybody engaged. Uh, just last weekend, I was at a con. I was trying a Powered by the Apocalypse game for the first time. It was a really neat game. In fact, I came back and I played a different Powered by the Apocalypse game the next day. But the poor GM, he had a great plot, he had a great plan, he had a great story. But we all started out in different places, and he was having trouble pulling us together. Mm -hmm. So poor thing, he was jumping from player to player to player to player to player, trying to keep up with all of us. And uh, I saw the trouble he was having, so I started nudging my player towards other people's scenes. Mm -hmm. If I could even vaguely conceive that my character could see what was going on in their scene, my character would come get nosy and stick his nose mm -hmm. in and try and join in. And I leaned into the player sitting next to me, I said, I, I don't want you to think I'm horning in on your action here. I'm just trying to take some weight off the GM. Mm -hmm. And I told that to the player while the GM was working with somebody else. So it was like, okay, you know. And then the GM was working with some other people. I ran over to another player and I had like a plan going with mm -hmm. them. It's like, oh, we could do this later in the game that'll bring us together, you know. And uh, I was just trying to take a little load off the GM. And in fact, he and I had a big long conversation about that. And so if you can get the party together, get the players together, get them interacting with each other, then that's fewer conversations you have to keep track of. Well, I think that's, that's an element of narrative storytelling, uh, but collaborative <clears throat> narrative storytelling, storytelling, which we might come back to in a later video, because you know when I was growing up and playing games, this is the story that you have given, and here are your actions in that story, and there's not a whole lot of conversation about how you as a group are changing things besides like, oh, you as a group defeated the big bad at the end, um, but how are you working together to build this story. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's one of the reasons some people check out is because, oh, that's that's your event, not my event. Right. Whereas you're pushing this our event. Yes, I, right? I strongly believe that, that the model I came up under, that the GM creates a world and the players get to experience it, was perfectly nice in the late 70s and the early 80s, but we've outgrown it. This medium of role-playing game as a social activity, as a narrative activity, as a shared storytelling, really the emphasis is on shared. Okay. That every way you can, you want the players involved actively, not just responsibly, not just uh, reactively, but actively engaging and making things happen. All right, so say you have a game where you do have multiple storylines because players have different goals in mind, or uh, you know, as a group, perhaps somebody take, comes to the fore as a loud voice, and so you want to split them up so that multiple people have right. voices and agency. Mm -hmm. How would you run multiple storylines? So I look to The Simpsons. Mm -hmm. The Simpsons uh, was one of the first shows I watched regularly that standard had two to three plots in it. Uh, I look back, and now that's pretty much stand, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's de rigueur now. But when I was a kid, shows had one plot you followed that one plot to the end. Wait, I'm, and, I'm used to television with A plots and B plots. There's always something in the background. Right, but uh, I'm a little bit older, and so I remember when there was a plot. Mm -hmm. Not the A plot, just there was a plot. You know, uh, Dick Van Dyke remarked about the Dick Van Dyke show that they worked very carefully to make sure that the plots were extremely easy to follow. Mm -hmm. And now the modern style is to make much more complex interwoven stories. Uh, Game of Thrones is a good example. There are lots of plots going on simultaneously. Well, a lot of those are all eight plots. You have to be on board with all of them at the same time. Well, that's, that's, and, and really, if you're a player... For you, there's always an A plot. Exactly. Okay. It, as a player, at the very least, my story is an A plot. Mm -hmm. I might think your story is a B plot, but you might disagree with me. So, so what I do is I try to interweave them a lot, and that means I jump around a lot. So, for instance, we're doing a Star Trek game, suppose, mm -hmm. right? So Star Trek, there's a lot of, the captain says, okay, you guys look at this and you guys look at that angle. And, you know, Troy, what do you think of this? And, you know, and so what do I do? I, I go around the table very fast. And I say, okay, you're working on this. You need to roll these. You're working on this. You need to roll these. You're working on this. You need to roll these. And then while everybody's rolling and finding out how they did, I'm not waiting for somebody. I'm giving the next player what they need to roll mm -hmm. for. And then I come back around and say, okay, how'd you do? Oh, I rolled really great. I say, okay, cool. What kind of breakthrough do you think your character might have made with a roll that high if I don't have something specific already written? 
which I'm about 50-50 on. Sometimes I know exactly what they're going to find if they roll high enough, and sometimes I'm like, you know, what, what makes the most exciting story? Well, I think I found a way to restart the goal. Now, in the background, I'm thinking, well, how can I throw a gear in that works? Oh, he can restart the engines, but he needs, you know, to recharge the dilithium by firing a phaser into the dilithium chamber, or, you know, whatever. You know, I'm going to use Star Trek terminology because that's, that's what I speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I come around to the next player and, and we have the same conversation. Oh, you know, I went and talked to the ambassador and, and I rolled this. Oh, the ambassador was really impressed with you, or, I, but I rolled this. Oh, the ambassador kicked you out. Now, what are you going to do to get back in? Because I don't really do, no, you're done. I do, mm -hmm. yes, but. And, uh, and then we come back around, right? And so in that way, I'm able to keep several stories going at the same time and then occasionally say, oh, it sounds like you're at a point that you need to go share this with so-and-so. And then I get out of the way and I let those two players talk. And this is one of the cases where a blah doesn't work mm -hmm. because I had them all doing different things at the same time but they were all in their own little microcosm and it's not that much work to go share that with another player as opposed to a big narrative scene where blah is critical this is a much smaller scene uh, that that a player can transmit in just a couple sentences anyway so it doesn't slow down play okay well thank you i think that that gives a lot of tips actually for engagement because now we've covered you know different positions at the table we've covered kind of how to speed up combat time and keep them all right on their toes because it might it's going to be your turn because you don't have time uh you know paying attention to each other's stories and taking part and sharing information uh, and we're gonna have to talk more about player knowledge versus character knowledge because i think that comes up a lot oh yes especially uh, in my games yes. where where i let the players know almost everything and i let the characters know very little that's very Hitchcock of you, I think. <laughs> well, that's that's where I got it from. Uh, and then the idea of keeping the party together in one car on one lane, and you're all driving together, or splitting them up and letting them explore different areas, mm -hmm. so that way their interest remains piqued the whole time. Hopefully. Yep. Hopefully it all does. Right. So thank you, and I think that was great. Uh, keep watching, and we'll be here.